Hello, everybody. Welcome to Broadway.com's Live at Five. It's Wednesday, September 16th. I'm Beth Stevens. And I'm Caitlin Moynihan. And it's just us ladies here today with you, but we do have a fabulous guest who's yes, with us, Caitlin. We do. Oh my gosh, we have Broadway composer, music arranger, and music director, incredibleness. Will Van Dyke with us here today. I try to think of all the ways to describe He requires what he incredibleness for his name. <laughs> he yeah, does, right. but yeah, we have him here with us today, so it's really exciting. He has many cool credits and a lot to talk about, but first we're gonna do some news for you. Yes. Now, Beth, I yes. told you a little bit about my history with this movie, Hocus Pocus, which is just, it's one of those like iconic fall movies, I guess. But the director, Mr. Kenny Ortega himself, said recently in an interview that he wants Hocus Pocus to come to Broadway. And he said, I'm gonna read you specifically what he said. He said, I'd love to do Hocus Pocus on Broadway. Perhaps Thomas Schumacher, the president of Disney Theatrical Group, would call and we could talk about it. It sounds like an invitation to Mr. Schumacher. Now tell the people, the uninitiated, <sighs> exactly what we're talking about here of course so of course guys this is kenny ortega director choreographer we actually were just talking about him he's the jackson that's right so, and of uh you know he newsies hello he did high dirty school dancing musical, dirty dancing um some things with madonna correct some probably he's done, everything. he's done everything but he is of course the director and choreographer of Pocus Pocus, there they are, the ladies, which star Tony winner Bette Midler, Plaza Sweet Bound star Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathina Jimmy as the witchy Sanderson sisters. There's a lot of music in this movie. Beth, you've said you've yeah. never seen it. I haven't, because I'm old, but you know, most people have seen it multiple times. It's it's a cult film. It is. And, and, and there's a lot of film. musical it you're <laughs> there's a lot of uh you know musical aspects to it. And I think it would lend itself very well to Broadway. So I hope it happens. Well, if Kenny wants to bring it, I think Kenny should bring it. Oh yeah. That's all I'm saying about that. All right, we're gonna move <laughs> on. We're gonna move on. So the Vineyard Theater, the wonderful off-Broadway house down there on 15th Street has announced its 2020 2020, 2021 season. And partly Ooh. this is digital and partly this is outdoor. So let me give you the rundown. They said when the downtown venue reopens, they are going to bring back Dana H, which uh, there's Deirdre O'Connell. And of course, it's by Lucas Nath, Tony nominee Lucas Nath. And the world premieres of two new shows, The Land Was Made by Tori Sampson and mm -hmm. Sandra by David Kale. And of course, David Kale had a big hit there last season with Harry Clark starring Billy Crudup. Now, they're officially kicking off their season September 23rd with Tony winner Bill Irwin it's called Bill Irwin's Busking Project, of course. That nice. means it's outdoors, in-person, socially distant live performance. He's a wonderful clown and actor and just all around genius. They have something else that's really interesting. It's called Lessons in Survival. And this mm. was conceived by Marin Ireland, Peter Mark Kendall, mm. Tyler Thomas, and Reggie D. White. This happens on October 6th, and this features actors channeling historic conversations. You actually hear the real conversations and then they sort of add to it. Ooh. And that way you're hearing old words with new meaning. Ooh. They've also commissioned five new artists for new works. There's a lot going on down at the vineyard and online with the vineyard and possibly Amazing. outside with the vineyard. <laughs> they're busy. Balance. Yeah, I they're very busy. It. Very busy. I love seeing what everybody's been doing. Creativity. And you know who else is doing some things? It's Miss Diablo Cody. Who, of course, she's she a is. Jagged Little Pill scribe. She wrote the book for the hit musical Jagged Little Pill. She's going to be working alongside Madonna herself to create a screenplay for the biopic about Madonna. The Madonna so, story. The Madonna happened. story. So the thing is, Madonna will not be in her own biopic. She said she's on the search for a young actress who will play her throughout her uh, trailblazing music career. Now- well, She must make an appearance. I mean, come on. She she's gonna have to. Like, she has to like, walk in the background. Pass her by. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, of course, uh, uh, Diablo Cody has that Broadway connection, but Madonna was famously in the movie adaptation of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Avita, which I have a quick, cute little photo right here. 
Um, so, you know, there's going to be some type of Broadway talk in this movie. One way or another, I think we're going to get some really interesting and fun moments. Yeah, I mean, it's very rich, very it's rich Madonna. material. It's yes. material, material girl. Material girl. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to one of our favorite people, Michael Yuri. He's working with Tracy Bennett in a new production. There he is. It's called The Extinction of Fireflies, and it's James Andrew Walsh's new comedy. Now it's in production, which means they're on location in James Andrew Walsh's Shelter Island home, which sounds oh. really nice. Uh, so nice it stars there. Michael Yuri, and as I said, Olivier Winner and Broadway alum Tracy Bennett takes place during Labor Day weekend in coastal New England. When a self-imagined playwright hmm, invites a longtime friend and le legendary TV diva, that's obviously Tracy Bennett, <laughs> and occasionally working actor, that's Michael Yuri, to read his latest dramatic effort, and, uh, you know, comedy ensues. We don't have dates or ticketing in information yet, but it sounds like a whole lot of fun out there on Shelter Island. I would okay. like to be there. It, it sounds, sounds, I mean, I want to be in a coastal New England town with Michael Yuri and Tracy Bennett. Yeah, all Sign me. Uh, um, we are going to get to our guest, but first, let's do Today in Broadway. Now, Beth, I get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is Mr. Hugh Jackman, because on this day in 2003, Hugh Jackman made his Broadway debut starring in The Boy from Oz, which is, of course, a jukebox musical based on the life of singer and songwriter Peter Allen and features all of his songs. Uh, this is the lovely poster of it. I mean, come on. So on I mean, he day, really shook his maracas in this show. He really shook those maracas. So it had its first preview tonight, September 16th. It officially opened on October 16th, and it ran through September 12th, 2004 at the Imperial Theater. Now, this was just an all-star cast, Beth. I mean, you got to see it, and you were just thinking about I got to how go to opening night. the cast was. Ooh, opening night. So it featured Isabel Keating. She earned a Tony nomination for this as Judy Garland. Tony winner, Stephanie J. Block as Liza Minnelli. Making her Broadway debut as well. Oh, her Broadway debut as well. Here, I mean, as, as Liza Minnelli. Look at them. Come on. Look at them. Yeah. Um, it also had Beth Fowler, Jared Emick, John Hill. I mean, it was just everything and this was marked uh hugh jackman's broadway debut which he eventually won the tony for 2004 right. tony award he won the drama desk for this as well he was By the, the toast of the town toast of the town because before this he had just kind of made his mark as wolverine as as we know in x-men he was also in kate and leopold underrated incredible movie <laughs> and but when in Australia, he did a lot of theater growing up. And prior to this, he was at Fate, he was Curly in the 1998 West End production of Oklahoma. And also which the was film, so you can which see was it. Filmed, and you can see him there looking all sweet like that. That's so right. And you know, I mean, Peter Allen was an Australian showman and superstar, mm -hmm. song and dance man, and a hero of Hugh Jackman's, which is why he wanted to portray him on Broadway. It's amazing. amazing. But he was also, he'd also done a big high profile carousel oh, with yes. Audrey McDonald at Carnegie Hall. So he, you know, he had his stage chops. Of course. And obviously yeah. since then he has hosted the Tonys like four times. He won an Emmy for hosting the Tonys. And of course he's been bringing his loves together by being in a lot of movie musicals like uh, Greatest Showman and Les Mis. And Les Mis is what Oscar earned him. His first Oscar nomination and a Golden Globe win. So that being said, we were supposed to we we were supposed to have already probably seen him back on Broadway by this time, Beth. Oh, now I'm feeling sad. Stop. I know. So <laughs> he's set to return as Harold Hill in The Music Man, starring opposite Sutton Foster. Obviously, the timeline has got all jumbled up, but they have said that they are hoping to open on May 20th, 2021, at the Winter Garden Theater. So fingers crossed that that can happen absolutely, and that we can see Hugh Jackman as Mr. Harold Hill. But That's yeah, right. I'm very thankful that on this day in 2003. On this day, Broadway, we got to go to Rio with Hugh Jackman. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Will you tell us about our guests? Oh, gladly. Yes, you guys, today, as we said earlier, we have... 
Broadway composer, musical director, arranger extraordinaire. There's so many ways that I can describe him. Uh, he, we have Will Van Dyke. He's going to be talking all about his upcoming set with Broadway Buskers, which is happening on September 22nd. He has worked on several shows, many that you guys know, including Pretty Woman, Kinky Boots, the off-Broadway Little Shop of Horrors, uh, the fresh new musical Fly. He also helped make the virtual miscast 20 happen. So he has been very busy. We're excited to talk to him all about his new music and what's going on. You can follow him on social at WVD Music and leave all of your questions in the comments below. Everyone, please welcome Will and Beth. Hi. Ooh. Hi, Will. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you for joining us, Will. Thanks for having me. I feel like you're in a recording studio. So I, I'm, 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 I'm in my office, which is like I a love recording it. studio. Yeah. It looks, it looks like it because you've got a very fancy microphone. Yeah. Um, now you are the one of the ultimate multi hyphenates. So you're a singer songwriter, you're a music supervisor, an orchestrator, and an arranger. And I will say I don't know the difference between all those things. So, so can you just lay it out for me a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, they're all obviously related. The So the singer songwriter thing is just, you know, writing songs and singing them. That's like the easiest one. Um, <laughs> and a music supervisor or music director, you know, they sort of like helm the music team of a musical. And sometimes that involves like multiple pe people being like an orchestrator, an arranger, a music director. And sometimes it's all one person. Um, and so the music director teaches the cast and music is in charge of conducting the show every night and just maintaining the show on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, an arranger is somebody who like takes the songs for the musical. So for Pretty Woman, Brian Adams and Jim Valance wrote these amazing songs, but then we had to like filter them through a musical theater like stage lens and had to tell the story of Pretty Woman. So it was just about making those songs tell the story and like extending them in places and shortening mm -hmm. them in places so that we could tell the story we needed to tell. Uh, guided by Jerry Mitchell, our director, obviously. And then the orchestration aspect is basically taking the very bare bones structure of a song and then expanding it to the orchestra that you hear every night at a show. So sometimes that's a huge orchestra, like in those great Rodgers and Hammerstein shows. And then, you know, sometimes it's a rock band, like in Rent. I really put you on the spot there. And you, hey, you okay. did that beautifully. That was Thank like a, such a good uh, way for me to learn. So you're going to be busking. Yeah on Tuesday. Now, you're not really busking. You're not really going on the street. Right? No, I'm going to be right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm going to do this exact thing, but I'm going to sing some new songs that I've been write, writing uh, since we started quarantine in March. Now, one of those new songs that I heard was with Betsy Wolf. Tell yeah. me about, about working on that. Oh, that is a song from a show I wrote with Rick Ellis called Magnificent Climb that we've been developing for a very long time uh and when all uh, when everything shut down i the union reached out to me the musicians union local 802 and asked if i would put together a video and song and i sent them that one and they thought it was great to just sort of raise awareness about musicians and all the people who are out of work right now um and we made that video and released it a month ago about a month ago uh yeah and betsy's the best but she actually recorded that vocal like that video is like two weeks maybe before she had her baby and oh, like wow. she sounds great it was so much fun to work with her i i love her to death oh she's amazing so tell me what it's like for you to do music and also miss cast 20 which was so much fun and 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 so popular to do all of that probably from where you're sitting right now because we're all separated from each other yeah, I was just talking about this with a guitar player friend of mine about how I'm sort of starting to hit my like limit for not being in a room with other people. It's yeah. it's been really hard, but uh it is super fun in a, a strange way, especially with miscast, you know, to to meet with these artists and talk about what they want to do on the song and then build it from, you know, bare bones like piano tracks and then send that to the artist pick the key pick the arrangement do all that stuff and then have that sort of virtual back and forth and then arrange it and send it to the band and then everybody sends their parts separately and then you sort of like 
build it in the computer and all of a sudden it becomes this like much bigger thing. So which, you're constantly getting pieces from different people, it sounds like. Yeah. And it, you know, it's it's a it's a different way of working and it's a new way of working, but it's also, you know, it is really special, especially with especially with something like You the Mountain and Me, where it's nine musicians playing all together and Betsy to like get those individual pieces and all of a sudden there's a string quartet and a, the band and it's, you know, there is something kind of magical about that too, as much as I would just love to be in a room and like make that sound together. You have some interesting credits because you've worked on Pretty Woman and you worked on Kinky Boots and those were both um, scored by people who are not really Broadway people, right? Yeah. They're, they're pop stars. So what were the challenges and what did you learn from Cindy Lauper and Brian Adams and Jim Balance? Well, so Kinky Boots, Stephen Aremus was the music supervisor and arranger and orchestrator. And I I started out as the associate music director and Brian Yusufer was the music director. And the three of us, you know, Stephen really did, like, I mean, he even has, he co-wrote a song from that show with her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, I learned so much about that process to like take me into Pretty Woman. But, you know, Cindy is somebody who, loves theater. She just loves musical theater. She loves the Rodgers and Hammerstein shows. So like she knows a lot about musical storytelling and her lyrics, I think are, you know, really clear in that way. So, you know, it, it was amazing to watch Steven and her navigate knowing, oh, this needs to be a dance number, but she doesn't, mm. you know, she doesn't write dance music. I mean, she writes, she writes bops, but like right. she, she doesn't write a dance break. So like taking mm -hmm. the themes that she's written and all that music and watching Steven expand that into, you know, everybody say, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, eventually over time I became the music director of Kinky Boots. And then when I left, I, I went to like do Pretty Woman in Chicago. And the experience with Brian and Jim was very similar to Cindy in that, you know, their knowledge of music is crazy, but they aren't the biggest musical theater fans on the planet. Like they didn't go into it knowing, but like during the process, Jerry sent them to see, she loves me. He sent, I mean, he sent them to see everything. So A they crash course. Yeah. And like musical storytelling, but I think there's something really awesome about uh, like these rock stars, like, just slamming like their stamp on a show because their sound is so iconic. So when Jerry met with Brian and Jim and heard their demos for pretty, the, the songs they wrote for pretty woman, you know, it just sounds like that time period and that, and, and it's, and it's so authentic that it's really cool. And I think the biggest thing I learned from Cindy Lauper is that music that isn't authentic, like you can, you can tell in like a heartbeat. And it's why that that score was so good is because it was just so authentically Cindy Lauper and rock and roll and the sound that she makes. And it never felt like she was trying to do something that she doesn't do. And that was a really important lesson to learn is like, you know, make the music that you make, keep it authentic and tell your story through your music, which is, you know, an important lesson to learn. And meanwhile, Little Shop is one of the best scores of all yeah, time. It's, I mean, it's one of the best shows ever written. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so perfect. tell me what was fun. I mean, it must have been so much fun to work on that and to work yeah. with those actors as well. I mean, <laughs> I miss it so much. It's, you know, I came home on March 12th. I was in London checking in on Pretty Woman there. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't been here since the first of the year because I went to La Jolla to do Fly. And so I was so looking forward to conducting the show on March 12th and being back at Little Shop of Horrors. And of course, that was the day that we all got the call that right. we're not going to work, which uh, so I'm still like very much like, oh, I can't wait to go back. Uh, but yeah, that whole experience, everything about it was so unique because everybody in that room was so invested in telling the same story and so funny and kind. And we were all, you know, making Little Shop of Horrors in the basement of the West Side Theater, like in two dressing rooms with like two tiny bathrooms and you have to climb two flights of stairs to get to the theater <laughs> and a ladder to get to the pit and it was very, you know, scrappy, but everybody was so invested in it and we knew we were making something really special. It was, and to work, and like working with Alan Menken, who is, you know, and 
a hero of mine was yeah. truly unreal. All right, bring me back to little Will, little <laughs> child Will. <laughs> what sparked yeah. your your excitement about theater and about music? Oh, geez. Was um, there a show, for example? Well, it's interesting because I remember uh, I had this really crazy weekend. So I grew up uh, studying classical piano and like loving music. Like I always loved music. I started when I was four playing the piano. And I like one of my earliest memories is a, a piano lesson where I like had a temper tantrum um, okay. because she wanted me to like march in a circle and rhythm. And I wanted to play the piano. I did gotcha. not want to march in a circle. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, over time, I was really studying classical piano. I had a, an amazing piano teacher and was living in Boston at the time. And the week, I, it was like the end of my junior year of high school, I went and saw an Elton John concert. Mm -hmm. And I it, like, blew me away. It was my first, like, big stadium concert. And I was like, oh, I don't know that, like, classical music is, like, going to resonate with people the way this does. And I really started like panicking and I'd always loved theater and I'd always loved music. And my brother took me to see into the woods at BU that weekend, mm. like very randomly, like a black box production of into the woods at BU. And I remember watching it and being like, Oh, maybe this is what I want to do. And yeah. I was still on the fence. And then the national tour of Aida came through town and I saw that and I, which, you know, married, the musical Elton theater, John. The Elton John thing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what I want to do. This, is, And so I applied to school for musical theater, not really knowing what it was or, and I got there very quickly. And my class was like, Carrie Menelakis and Atu Blankenwood yeah. and all these people. And I was like, yeah, this, this is not, this is, the, I'm going to play the piano and I'm going to, yeah. you know, and I figured out sort of where I fit in this mold. And what was your first professional job on Broadway? Uh, the, I subbed, the first show I subbed was Wicked on Broadway because I did the first national Gotta start theater. at the top, don't you? Yeah, and then, <laughs> but the first chair I ever held was uh, The Adams Family. So much fun. All right, yeah. we know that the people have the questions, but before we go to your fan questions, I have one more. Yeah. Have you ever busked? Have, have I ever, ever busked? Busked. I, we did, I did Broadway Buskers last year with my friend Chris. Uh, so that was actually outside? That was actually outside in Times Square. How, how was it to be out there with the <laughs> it crowd? It was really wild. We had a guitar player and my best friend on the cello. And yeah, it was the three of us and a drummer who played like a cajon because you can't play drums in Times Square. Fun fact. Right. Um, and yeah, it was, it was actually super duper fun. Like people just walked by and were like, what is going on? And we were like, we're singing songs. Check it out. But you never did it like in your life. You never just set up on a street corner somewhere. No, I have not done that. You know, there's still time. There, there is still time. <laughs> Twenty. Uh, Twenty. Maybe, maybe down the line. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin, what are the people online asking? <laughs> Got to dance. Go do that. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the first question we have is, Jared wants to know what is the typical process for helping bring a new musical like Pretty Woman to Broadway for your job? Like how involved in the room are you or how much happens on your own time at like an office or a studio somewhere? Yeah, so on Pretty Woman, we did readings just like you do with any new musical, but uh, a lot of it on like the front half, the prep, Part of it is getting the songs because uh, rock stars generally don't notate their music. They just like sing and play it for you. And so you have to write it down. And then there's a lot of, you know, if it's an ensemble song, you write the ensemble parts before you get there, knowing that you're going to change it all when everybody hears it. <laughs> so, it's, you know, it's 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 like kind of a, I don't know, it, they're like layers. It's like a layered cake. You start with like, I write it down and then you just sort of add the other layers to it as you go. And through a reading process, it it makes it feel a little bit more organic and less like do it all now and get overwhelmed mm -hmm. by it, if that makes Got any sense. Got it, yeah, that does make sense. Okay, Brooke would like to know, now that we've been you know six months into quarantine, was it hard at first to kind of go from you being with so many other people and maybe like hearing other musicians and music to kind of doing it all in your head, in your own room. What was that process? It's all in the headphones now. 
Yeah, it's <laughs> it's kind of awful. It's funny because the daytime part of it actually hasn't been that bad because I'm so used to just sitting at my desk with my keyboard and writing or like arranging or orchestrating. And I know what that is, but then I'm so used to going someplace after that mm -hmm. and hearing it. And that's been the really hard part because you just get, oh, Siri thought I was talking to her. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and it just gets like, you're like, oh, I'm not going to know what this sounds like until I get a file back from somebody. And that's a little, you know, mm. that's sad. That's that, that is truly genuinely like the hardest part, but the, the being at home during the day writing thing feels very normal. And, and I'm very grateful for that. Cause I know that some people, this has affected their work life in mm. horrible, horrible ways, but like my daytime actually feels pretty normal. All right. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, okay. So Jackson wants to know if there was a specific musical that got you into wanting to do like composing and arranging on Broadway. Was there something specific that made you go, yes, that's what I want to do. Uh, yeah. I think it was that combination of, of into the woods, Aida. Mm -hmm. I also have like a huge affinity for Andrew Lippa's wild party. Like when I discovered that, that like, like rocked my world in like the hugest way. Um, and just knowing like, oh, that that's like a, that's a thing that people make and it's so <laughs> good. Like it's, it's just so prolific and good. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's what I want to be a part of. Cause it like marries the pop jazz whole, like all of it together in a really yeah. awesome way. Ooh. And Julia Murney on that record is Julia Murney, man. Gorge. A plus. A plus. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Okay, Juliana wants to know, what do you remember from your very first day, like working a Broadway show? Like being there and being like, this is my work or being involved in it. What do you remember from that day? Um, If I, that I'll get fired if I screw up for good. <laughs> <laughs> there's like this, in Wicked, there's like this giant, like the, really the only like horrifying part of the show is like this giant exposed piano solo at the top of for good. And like, if you play it wrong, everybody would know because it's so <laughs> iconic too. And you're like, ah, but mostly it was just really exciting and fun. And yeah, I don't know. Love it. Terror um, is what you remember. Yeah, but it turned out great. I, well, I, I remember being very excited, but I also like, it's that adrenaline thing. You have so much adrenaline that you sort of like black out. Obviously, First of all, ended up okay. Yeah, <laughs> blacking out. Yeah, right there at the Gershon Theater. Obviously, I feel like it's worked out pretty well for you, though. Yeah, it looks. It sounds yeah. like you're you're gonna be fine. So, do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about what we can see if we? First of all, if you want to see Broadway Buskers on Tuesday, it's at seven o'clock, and go to timesquareNYC.org, and you'll mm -hmm. be able to, to see it. And it's also for a good cause, right, Will? Yeah. I mean, uh, every week they do this, uh, it, it's me and two other artists, um, this week. And it, there are three artists every week and you, everybody gets to sing like a 20 minute set. Um, I'm going to be singing all new songs that I've never shared before, which I'm really, really excited about. And you know, it's great. And I'm so grateful for the Times Square Alliance and Broadway buskers for having me because it's fun to play music. <laughs> and you can do it inside this year. Yeah, and we can do it inside. <laughs> so so head there to check it out. Thank you for joining us, Will. Yeah, thank Always you for having me. You. Yeah. Caitlin, will you take us on out, please? Gladly. Yes, thank you guys so much for tuning in for another great episode of Live at Five Home Edition. You can follow along where we get your podcast by searching for hashtag Live at Five and hitting that subscribe button. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. We talk to Miss Tony nominee Ava Noblezada. And taking us out today is a clip of Hugh Jackman and the company of The Boy from Oz singing, I Go to Rio. When my baby's loves me, it's gonna lie, yeah.